Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel, Sabaton Arm. We got another one for you today. I got a Patreon request this time from Stephen Hardy. He said, hey man, why don't you go check out that song, Atero Dominatus. It was mentioned in one of the earlier videos. I said nobody had requested it, and Stephen was like, yo, this is the official request. I'm requesting it right now. So this is one of their older songs. As I was getting all the videos queued up to watch, I noticed that they had an official music video but uh, the quality on it was super terrible. The aspect ratio was super terrible. So I looked around a little bit and I found a uh, fan-made video. We're gonna watch that instead. It's got subtitles, so that, that's good. It gives me the lyrics on top of it. So we're gonna watch that first. Then we're gonna jump into a live performance. I believe it's at Vakken. I'm not, I don't, I don't remember what year. I wanna say 2017, but I might be wrong. And then uh, to finish it up, obviously like we do on this channel, we're gonna be watching the Sabaton history for Atero Dominatus. So that's uh, the lineup for today. If that's what you're in for, hang around. We're going to jump into it. If uh, that's too much for you, hey, thanks for stopping by. Um, appreciate everybody's comments and uh, likes and subscriptions and all that kind of stuff. You guys have really been helping my channel grow. Creeping up on 4,000 subscribers. That's big for me. I mean, I've only been doing this since October. So, uh, you know, it's only been three months. And you guys have been helping out the channel grow like crazy. And I thank you so much. Sabaton Army has been a huge part of that. So... Thank you, Sabaton Army. If you're new to my channel, uh, and you by the end of this video, if you like what I'm doing here, give me a like down below, and uh, it really helps the channel grow. It helps YouTube recognize videos that people like and uh, churns them out to other people to take a look at, so I appreciate that. And if you want to come along for the ride and see what else we're going to be watching in the future, the big red subscribe button down there. Click on that. It'll turn gray. And uh, if you hit that notification bell, it'll let you know anytime something new is coming out on the channel. So. Appreciate that. All the patrons, including uh, my, the person who requested this song, Stephen Hardy. I appreciate all my patrons. They're uh, helping support the channel financially, helping us get new equipment, new uh, software, that kind of stuff, make better videos for you guys. So if you want to join the Patreon, we've got a link down below in the description. Got another one up here in the corner of the screen. And that's it for all the promos. Let's go ahead and jump into Atero Dominatus. No idea what it's about, but I'm ready to learn. Here we go. Tero Dominatus. Oh, <laughs> 
All right. Awesome job on that music video by A.S. Cotter, or As Cotter, maybe. Great job on that video. Uh, a pretty great song as far as message goes. This is a, the fall of the Third Reich, it looks like. A good song, too. This is from early in Sabaton's uh, uh, history, back when they were pretty new. Uh, it, was a, it was a banger back then, so uh, good for them. They come around at the gates with some heavy stuff. I know uh, someone told me in the comments that they didn't really start with uh, history type stuff. They were just started as a regular metal band, but then they kind of morphed into the history thing. So uh, th this might have been one of their, as far as I know, this might have been one of their uh, first history songs that they did. So very cool. It's catchy. It's got a good beat. The guitars are great on it. And uh, it'll go on the playlist. I know right now. I can tell. I'm already, I've already got the Otero Dominators. I got that stuck in my head already. And I've only listened to it once. So uh, cool. Let's check out this live performance at uh, Vakken Open Air 2019. So pre-COVID. Uh, let's see how it looks. Okay, I think I remember someone telling me in the comments that they brought two bands for Sabaton for this concert, and they were using both these stages. They've got the modern band over here on the stage closest to camera right now, and then they've got the old band over on the other stage. It looks like they might actually have the other band over there now, and Joachim's over there with them singing the old songs, but the... Uh, Current band is over here as well on this side. Is this is this the performance that you guys were telling me about where they were doing that? Let me know in the comments.
<laughs> yeah, that was cool. What a cool idea to do to bring the old band back on one stage while the new band supports them. And it's cool that, you know, there's no friction between the two groups, at least as far as I know. That's very unique. I've never seen a group do that before uh, right on Sabaton. All right, we're going to be going into the history lesson here in a second. So for those of you who don't like hanging around for the history, hey, appreciate you stopping by. And don't forget to come on back. But uh, for the rest of us who love the history, like to learn what's going on in these songs, we're going to jump into this history lesson. This is... Atero Dominetus, the Battle of Berlin, Sabaton History number 25. And here we go. I'm Andy Nidell. And I'm Pat from Sabaton, and this is Sabaton History. The battle. <laughs> right, can we take a second to appreciate the long blonde hair and uh, short goatee on par? Haven't seen that before. The Battle of Berlin in 1945 saw Hitler's suicide and the surrender of the German capital. And we wrote a song called Ater Dominatus about that. In the winter of 1941 and 42, when the German army was driven back from the gates of Moscow, the Soviet troops who had survived the first disastrous months of the German invasion brought with them Soviet cameramen, whose footage gave the world its first look at what the Germans had done in Russia. The film they produced, known in the West as Moscow Strikes Back, was described by the New York Times Review as follows. The villages are not villages, but charred honeycombs of little low walls that once were houses, schools, or even cathedrals, but infinitely more terrible are the charnel heaps of twisted grotesques that no longer resemble human beings, the naked and slaughtered children stretched out in ghastly rows, the youths dangling limply in the cold from gallows that were rickety, but strong enough. Among them wander the living mothers, their faces set in freezes of grief. All right, so when you're watching this back, all this will be blurred out. I can't show all those dead bodies on YouTube, but uh, horrible, tragic, terrible. And sometimes a Red Army soldier gazing on the broken bodies with a silence like flame. Over the next three years of fighting, any soldier fortunate enough to survive that ordeal had seen scenes like that time and again. In April 1945, those soldiers arrived at the gates of Berlin. By the beginning of that year, Western and Soviet armies were converging on Germany. For the past three and a half years, though, the main brunt of the fighting had been borne by the Soviet Red Army. Although the figure varies between 8 and 20 million, it is estimated that around 15 million Soviet soldiers were killed by the end of the war. That figure does not count the many millions of dead Soviet civilians. In February 1945, the Allied leaders met at Yalta to discuss what would happen with Germany post-war. And they agreed that Germany would be divided into four occupation zones, British, American, French, and Soviet, and that Berlin, the capital, would likewise be carved up into four sectors. Despite this, and as the victorious outcome of the war began to appear more and more certain, mistrust between the Allies had begun to grow, and military leaders on both sides feared that words on paper would mean little without boots on the ground to back them up. Joseph Stalin organized a general Soviet offensive to drive as far into Germany as possible and played upon the rivalry between his two top commanders, Georgi Zhukov and Ivan Konev, by encouraging them to compete with one another to win the glory of capturing Berlin. In the West, Winston Churchill reportedly urged General Dwight Eisenhower to attempt to capture the city. But Eisenhower eventually decided against such an operation, not wishing to expend Allied lives, capturing more and more territory, which the Allies had already agreed at Yalta to give to the Soviets, and fearing friendly fire between Western and Soviet forces. So as the Soviet forces advanced on Berlin, Eisenhower ordered the Western armies to halt on the Elba and Mulder rivers and focus on mopping up the remaining German forces on their northern and southern flanks. The German army, in 1945, 
was by now a shadow of its former self, reduced in part to old men and boys. Nevertheless, they fought on, each for his own reasons. What can be said with certainty is that most everyone was afraid of the Russians, afraid of what would happen to them in Russian captivity, and afraid of what would happen to their families once the Russians were given the opportunity for revenge. Those veterans remaining from the campaigns in the East who had seen and perhaps taken part in the atrocities there had little reason to doubt the rumors of impending Soviet vengeance. The Red Army operations took the shape of two great offensive lunges. The first was the Vistula Uder offensive from January 12th to February 2nd. Zhukov advanced in the center while Konev advanced in the south. Following this, Soviet forces moved rapidly across Poland until they halted along the lines of the Oder and Nice rivers, with bridgeheads established across the Oder some 70 kilometers east of Berlin. Although the city was undefended at this time, Zhukov gave the order to halt, as his northern flank was threatened by the German Second Army. Clearing out these forces was accomplished between February 24th and April 4th, with the Second Army being surrounded and mostly destroyed in Gdansk. With his northern flank secure, Zhukov could now prepare for the final frontal assault towards Berlin. However, the delay had given the Germans time to rebuild their defenses along the Oder River. On March 20th, German General Gotthard Heinrichi was appointed commander of them. He assumed that the main Soviet thrust would be across the river along the axis of the main east-west autobahn. Being vastly outnumbered, he planned a defense in depth, deploying only light forces along the riverbanks, while the main defensive position was established on the Zilov Heights, overlooking the road 17 kilometers to the west of the river. German engineers turned the Oder's floodplain into a marsh by breaching a reservoir, while on the heights, they constructed three defensive belts with lines of trenches, bunkers, anti-tank guns, and ditches. As expected, Zhukov concentrated his attack on the section of the line opposite the Zilov Heights, but the overall redeployment left gaps in the Soviet lines, allowing what little remained of the German Second Army to escape to the west. The Red Army forces had between them 2.5 million men, 6,000 tanks, and over 7,500 aircraft. They were opposed by about 760,000 Germans of Army Group Vistula in the north and Army Group Center in the south, with about 1,500 tanks and 2,200 aircraft between them. The Berlin Strategic Offensive began April 16th with a massive artillery barrage against the German positions. Despite their advantage in firepower and numbers, though, advancing proved difficult for Zhukov's first and Rokossovsky's second Belarusian fronts in the marshlands created by the German engineers. Frustrated and behind schedule, Zhukov threw in his reserves, committing to massed human wave assaults, which led to heavy Soviet casualties. Meanwhile, Konev's first Ukrainian front had made progress in the south against weaker opposition by Army Group Center and following the capture of Forst on April 18th, the remaining elements of the German 9th and 4th Panzer armies defending the Zilov Heights were forced to withdraw or risk being outflanked from the south. But their withdrawal left the way open for Zhukov, who now moved to trap the German forces in a pincer movement with Konev's front. As for the Western Allies, they had halted on the Elbe River. Thanks to captured documents, the Germans knew they were unlikely to advance any further in the immediate future. Hitler ordered General Walter Wenck's 12th Army, currently fighting the Americans, to head east to link up with the 9th Army as it retreated west, after which the two armies together would relieve Berlin. However, by April 23rd, the 9th Army had been completely cut off, as we saw in the episode Hearts of Iron about Walter Wenck. And by the 24th, the encirclement of Berlin was complete. Wenck chose to force open a corridor, which would allow the breakout of the 9th Army and the evacuation of civilians from the city, then to make for the Western lines with as many civilians as they could bring with them and surrender to the Americans. On April 22nd, Hitler 
had ordered General Helmut Weidling to be shot for allegedly retreating from the enemy. As it turned out, Weidling had not in fact retreated, and when he showed up at the Fuhrer bunker to tell Adolf Hitler that much, Hitler was apparently impressed, and the next day, he appointed Weidling as the commander of the Berlin Defense Zone. Weidling had under his command a motley assortment of approximately 45,000 Wehrmacht and Waffen-SS troops, 40,000 Volkssturm militia, and various other units formed from the Hitler Jugend and local police. They were surrounded by around 1.5 million Soviet troops. The result was nine days of brutal house-to-house -house fighting, during which the German forces, though massively outnumbered and also outgunned, still managed to inflict heavy casualties on the Soviet attackers. The two Soviet fronts attacking Berlin, having collaborated to achieve the encirclement, promptly resumed their competition with renewed vigor, each fighting to reach the city center before the other. Adolf Hitler, having chosen to remain in the city rather than flee, committed suicide on April 30th. General Wielding, like a little bitch, <laughs> ordered the remainder of the garrison to attempt to break out towards their western front lines. A handful would successfully surrender to the Allies, while the majority were killed or captured by the Soviets. On May the 2nd, General Wielding ordered those units who remained in the city of Berlin to surrender, and he surrendered to Soviet General Vasily Chuikov in person and in writing that morning. Chuikov's 8th Guards Army was part of Zhukov's first Belarusian front. As the Soviet army entered the ruined city, the civilian population was subjected to a wave of rape, pillage, and murder which continued for several weeks. While the exact figures are far from certain, it is believed that civilian deaths exceeded 125,000, though the extent to which these figures were attributable to what would today be called collateral damage rather than simple murder cannot be determined. Additionally, approximately 100,000 women were raped in Berlin out of approximately 2 million raped in the entire country during the final six months of the war. On the other hand, it should be noted that under the direction of Zhukov, efforts were made both during and after the battle to ensure that the civilian population of the city was provided for and that vital services were restored. German military deaths in the course of the whole operation totaled around 100,000, while the Soviets suffered approximately 80,000 killed and an additional 280,000 wounded. The end of the Battle of Berlin was shortly followed by Germany's unconditional surrender. On May the 6th at Rem, Alfred Jodl offered to surrender all forces fighting the Western Allies, but Eisenhower told him it must be all forces on all fronts or the Western Allies would close their lines and all surrendering would be done to the Soviets. Admiral Karl Dönitz, leader of Germany after Hitler's death, authorized that, and just after midnight Jodl signed it. The next day, German representatives went to Berlin and signed another surrender in front of Zhukov, whose army had won the race to Berlin. Ironically, however, Konev would have the last laugh. The glory of Zhukov's many victories turned out to be too much for Stalin's taste. And within a year, Zhukov had been banished from Moscow, first to command the Odessa district and then the Urals district, though he would be rehabilitated after the death of Stalin. Konev, meanwhile, enjoyed a long, successful and uninterrupted career. The Western Allies, despite having occupied more of Germany than their Yalta allocations, chose to honor the agreement and withdraw to the agreed-upon boundaries. And in turn, Soviet Union would allow them to occupy their assigned portions of Berlin. In the song, in the lyrics, you sing Berlin is burning. Now, have you ever played this in Berlin? Yes, of course we have. Uh, Sabaton has been performing everywhere in the world and we didn't really take that much of uh, offense when people said, oh, this song, maybe it's too sensitive to yeah, perform sure, yeah. in Berlin. But uh, there were some promoters earlier who said, well, this is your show in Berlin, but don't play the song at Terra Dominatus. Promoters are always worried about stuff like the, that. The, 
Parr's got an AK-47 on his lap. <laughs> They're worried about politics sometimes that we are there. I mean, uh, you know, I told you about the story when we went to Russia and the, a local politician thought oh, yeah. we're going to burn the flag. It was a similar idea uh, the first time we came to Berlin. Like, you, you're going to play the song uh, Atera Dominatus and burn the, uh, the German flag on the stage. And, and it was what like... Why do people think these things of you? What have you ever done that would imply that you're going to do that? I, I could understand. I mean, in 2006, as this song was released, uh, Sabaton was not that, you know, well known. Right. And uh, we didn't have too many fans who would kind of defend us and tell Sabaton is not about politics, they tell stories. Um, the, the whole thing about it was basically like this. All right, I believe they're done barking. Let's jump back in. We had our first tour oh. in Europe, thanks to the... Uh, basically like this. We had our first tour in Europe, thanks to the album Primo Victoria. We are supporting the bands Ed Guy and Dragon Force. And uh, at this time, the label says, we might be able to cover some of your costs on this tour if you make another album before you go out. Okay. And we really had to rush the album Atera Dominatus. And what about, what about the video for Atera Dominatus? The video, it was our first official music video. Yeah. We did it with Uba, who was uh, a director from the band Nocturnal Rights. We didn't know what to expect at all. And, and he was like, you need to bring some cooler clothes than what you are wearing normally. Because before this, we were wearing leather pants and leather jackets. Yeah. And uh, that's our stage the standard clothes. uniform. Yeah. Yeah. Joachim bought this vest on a show in uh, England and uh, just walking around, he saw that. This could fit. It looks yeah. like a kind of military thing. Yeah. And then we thought about, okay, we, we get kind of a uniform. It was for the video shoot. And then um, a couple of months later, we were sitting down at Sweden Rock Festival and we were watching it together with some friends. And uh, we were all like, damn, wow. It's a simple video, yeah. but we love the energy in it. And we love the look. So we kept the loop. You can, and these, these are my favorite part of these. I love these. <laughs> That's, I always like that. All right, ladies and gentlemen, well, that is all for today, but we will see you next time and every time on Sabaton History. That's it for today. If you're wondering why I was holding a Kalashnikov, it was that it was first time used as a prototype during the Battle of Berlin that we just talked about. So please don't forget to subscribe, become a patron, and see you soon. All right. So it may not surprise any of you to know that uh, I'm not taught any of that kind of history here in the United States. So uh, we're only taught the American side of what happened during World War II. I mean, we, we, we heard, you know, obviously about uh, Hitler's suicide and how all the surrenders happened, that kind of stuff. But we're never taught that the Russians were the ones to do the final push into Berlin. The I, uh, I had a friend at work sent me a video that talked about the human lives lost during World War II, and it was all done with graphics and scales. And uh, the Russian losses were so immense that you could have added every other country that participated in World War II, you could have added all their numbers together and you might have gotten to half of what was lost by Russia. They never teach us that, that Russia was the biggest uh, victim of losses during World War II, but they were also huge uh, influence and, and allies in defeating the Germans and the, uh, the Nazis and, and taking power back and ending the war. So none of that stuff's ever taught over here. I, I never would have learned it if it wasn't for YouTube and people showing me what they know about this kind of stuff. So very cool history, great song. It's definitely going on the playlist. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, you guys got a cameo from my dog, Finn. He got a little scared, wanted to sit on my lap there for a minute. So uh, that's Finn. I got one more dog upstairs, Roxy. She's watching the front door and when she starts barking, Finn goes crazy. Uh, if you guys like this video, give me a like down below. Helps the channel out a lot, doesn't cost you anything. You just click on that like and go on with your life and, and everything's good. If you uh, want to come along for the journey and see some more of these Sabaton uh, deep dives with me, hit that big red subscribe button down below, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell to let you know anytime I drop some new Sabaton content. I've got so many songs requested 
that I'll probably be doing at least two Sabaton deep dives a week for the whole next year. That's how many songs I've got on my list from people requesting Sabaton songs. So as long as you guys keep watching them, I'll keep doing them. I enjoy doing them. I'm learning so much history that I never would have known. My wife told me, hey, by the time you're done with this thing, you're going to be one of the biggest Sabaton army members out there. You're going to know everything about all their songs. So, uh, hey, that's cool. And then I'll go see them in concert and I'll be able to rock along with them. So, appreciate everybody coming by. If you want to support the channel on Patreon, there's a link down below. There's also another button up here in the corner. And that is all for this video. Thank you, everybody, for staying this long. If you stayed this long into the video and you want to let me know that you made it this far, put a comment down in the comment section below that says pirate ship. Pirate ship. If you say pirate ship in the comments, I'll know you stuck around all the way to the end of Otero Dominators. All right, that's all I got for today, everybody. Appreciate you stopping by, and don't forget to come on back.